Our first guest is uh, good. If, if you've committed uh, creepy acts, you might go in front of this guy here. Judge Stephen Redding is with us. Judge, good morning to you. Morning. It's good to see you, gentlemen. Yeah, yeah. Good to see you too. How many years have you been on the bench? Coming up on six. Six. And and so your term is up. Is this was that a six year term, or did you get appointed to replace somebody? I was appointed to replace Judge Silver, uh, and was appointed March of 2018. Had to run in the uh, election in May of 2018. Mm -hmm. And finished out the six years of his term, six okay. and a half years. You were coaching basketball at that time, were you? I not? was, uh, and we're not permitted to have any associations with any organizations that might come before us. The Board of Education uh, is, a, a, I won't say a frequent litigant, but they have their share of, of uh, lawsuits. So uh, the Judicial Investigation Commission has cautioned us not to have even a coaching relationship uh, volunteer, which was disappointing to, to learn. I also... Uh, and I think we talked about this in the past. I've been in the fire service since I was 19 years old. And mm -hmm. after four years of uh, being on the bench and being a volunteer fireman in Berkeley County, I was told I wasn't supposed to be doing that. So I had to step down from that last October. Now, the governor can still coach basketball and be governor, but you can't be that's, judge and coach basketball. That's correct. That doesn't seem right to me, Bill. Nor to me, nor to me, and also the volunteer fire department. That's yeah. that's even more of a stretch to me. That's a uh, there are litigants, litigants at all with the fire with the volunteer fire department. Is there? I'm sorry. Have there been uh, suits against the, uh, the volunteer fire department? Why did, why are they considered to be? You the, cannot participate. The perspective of the JIC is that if you are at a fire station on a regular basis and you're associating with law enforcement that there might be a perception that you would favor law enforcement testimony over other litigants and uh, which you know would not be the case with me yeah. uh, I would take each witness as, as they come. also historically I was a volunteer firefighter for many years um, historically the volunteer fire departments were political organizations you know going I don't know that it was true here in West Virginia but certainly in the Northeast that was that was a big deal so yeah the, I can tell you the the volunteer fire stations around here are, or other than their own interests are fairly apolitical but they are active they're active in in the community what's going on in the community oh, absolutely and also that used to be one of the first places you wanted to go to run for office you want to go in front of the volunteer fire department get their support their endorsement right absolutely so, so Stephen you are running for re-election I am yeah, yes, sir. And, and that will be a four-year term? Eight-year term. Eight-year term. Yes, sir. Okay. So uh, what are some of the reasons uh, why you are running for re-election? Well, I love the job. You know, I've, I've had two jobs in my lifetime that, that have just been uh, tremendous experiences. The first one was a career fireman down in the D.C. area, and the second is a judge. And uh, I was a lawyer in between those two jobs, and that waxes and wanes. There's days you just, you know, don't don't care to do the, the work you're doing and and uh, it becomes laborious and and uh, the hours are insane uh, not that they're not somewhat insane now but I, I just really really have enjoyed the uh, the six years I've been on the bench and and I think I've done a good job the feedback I get has been positive for the most part um, so I'm you know I'm looking to finish out that uh, 16 year uh, term to get to the point of retirement. I would be 73 when I hit the 16 years, and I uh, just love the job. Mm -hmm. um, so it's uh, a little bit of a selfish interest mm -hmm. there, obviously. But How is the workload in this circuit in regards to what the judge must handle? It is, uh, we, we're going to need another circuit judge at some point, and we have some issues that go along with that. We, we have some space limitations that we're working with the county uh, commission on we don't have any room for another judge at the current courthouse uh, we have another magistrate coming in january of 25 and i think we're going to be able to squeeze the magistrate and a magistrate assistant into the building uh, we're there's talk about a that would be our seventh magistrate there's talk of the need for an eighth magistrate we have nowhere to put that magistrate now if we were to get that magistrate we have another family uh, court judge coming and I think we have space for the family court judge. But once the new magistrate and the new family court judge come in, we're out of space in the judicial center. There is, we don't have a closet to put somebody in. Uh, so there's a couple of things that are being looked at and, and discussed by the commission in terms of a, a uh, kind of a stopgap stop measure to 
get us to the point that we can build out the Crawford Building, which is right behind the Judicial Center, between the Judicial Center and the Dunn Building. It's a historic building. Uh, but the the funding that will be needed for that, my understanding is we're probably looking at 2028 to 2030 before mm-hmm. we can actually put bodies in that building. So, uh, so are we in the position where we can still offer people a timely trial? We are. We are. And we do a good job as a team of juggling courtrooms and uh, making sure, for instance, Judge McLaughlin is uh, sitting in Berkeley County now. She's doing Berkeley and Morgan, and she doesn't have her own designated courtroom at this point. So the other four judges in the building, you know, when when we have uh, free time on our docket, when we're doing other things, then we certainly allow her to come in and use our courtrooms. And Mm -hmm. we'll continue doing that as long as we need to. But we're looking at trying to find another building somewhere in the downtown area to build out as a a circuit court courtroom and and have a judge sitting there full time. You so, recently were hold on a second there, John. You recently were involved in uh, the situation with the Jefferson County Commission. I was where you had to make a decision as to whether you would pass along to the Supreme Court the recommend uh, the, the petition for removal for two county commissioners in uh, Jefferson County, Krause and Jackson. Can you tell me about that procedure and that process that you had to follow? and what you were looking for in that petition, and then passing it along to the next level. Certainly. The statute in West Virginia for removal of constitutional officers is that you have to have a petition filed, and the petition can be filed either by the uh, county political body, uh, county commissioner, county council, and the alternative, the prosecutor can file it. That's what happened in Jefferson County. Or, I believe it's 10% of the number of voters in the last election need to, whatever the, the number is for 10%, so if 1,000 people voted, 100 people need to sign a petition. Mm-hmm. And it could be brought that way. It was by virtue of um, Matt Harvey, who I know is on this program a lot. He, Matt brought that uh, petition. There was a preliminary hearing before Judge Hammer, uh, who is the supervising judge in Jefferson County. Judge Hammer looked at it, and essentially our duties are pretty ministerial uh, up until it goes to the Supreme Court. Judge Hammer looks at the four corners of the complaint, and if you take as true what's on the four corners of the complaint, you then have to determine would those allegations merit removal by a three-judge panel, and Judge Hammer found that if you take as gospel what is in the four corners of that petition that Mr. Harvey filed, uh, that that could merit removal. Uh, So then it got bumped to me for a review of what Judge Hammer did as as chief uh, judge for the 23rd Circuit, and I took a look at it, and and clearly, you know, what was on the four corners of the document could lead a a three-judge panel to remove the the folks that were the subject of the petition. So I then sent it to the Supreme Court, uh, Chief Justice Beth Walker, and uh, essentially told her that this meets the requirements of the statute and and, uh, kindly appoint a three-judge panel and let's uh, let the process work its way out. If uh, Sheriff Harmon had not resigned, would his process been the same? Well, and I I have to be careful talking about that because uh, I'm I'm not sure. I I believe there's a change of plea hearing today before Judge Faircloth. Okay. And that matter, although I continued the hearing pending his resignation, that matter is uh, still pending on my docket. Yeah. Um, But, yes, the the process is exactly the same. It was... It was supposed to come to me last week for that preliminary hearing, same one that Judge mm-hmm. Hammer did in mm-hmm. Jefferson County. Uh, and I was, would have taken on the role that Judge Hammer took in Jefferson as well as the role that I took in the Jefferson County case. And, and if on the four corners of that document, hypothetically speaking, uh, the, the uh, issues raised merited removal from office, I would have sent that to the Supreme Court, and uh, uh, just an unfortunate situation. Going, if I could, going back very quickly to the election, now all the judges are up for re-election this year, they're not. That's correct. Not just you, but all the judges, and the magistrates and circuit and family judge all up for re-election. That's correct. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. 
Do I understand that you were <coughs> chief judge of the circuit court? Is that I, right? I am. Yes, sir. So is that a discrete position for which you run, or is, are you a circuit court judge who is somehow voted to be chief? I, I don't understand the structure. Yeah, it's really informal. It's uh, And I like to joke because people, when I became chief judge at the beginning of this year, congratulated me, and I was, you know, don't congratulate me. It's tag, you're it. Mm -hmm. And uh, Judge Morrison did a, a really, really good job as chief judge. Um, and every year we would have a discussion and we would all say, oh, you're doing a great job, keep it up. And he, he does so much with the Judicial Association, uh, drug court, business court, that's uh, in addition to your regular duties that I felt like, you know, he deserved a break from having to take care of what's going on all over the circuit in the uh, three counties that we have. So, um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's by vote of the sitting circuit court judges. Okay. So let's talk a, a little bit about um, the pressure that's on the judicial system right now. Someone is arrested today f for a felony. When is he likely to actually see um, a trial? Are we talking months, better part of a year? That is so dependent on the facts of the case. Um, yeah, and I, I would say that if the first question, one of the first questions at a arraignment, where they come in, they plead not guilty, uh, is do you waive your right to a speedy trial? If they don't waive their right to a speedy trial, they have to be tried within that term of court. Uh, and we have three terms of court each year. So if I have a grand jury in February and they want to be tried in that term of court, I've got to get the trial in by the April grand jury. Uh, so they're entitled to a trial within six months. now. Probably 90% of the defendants that come to an arraignment waive their right to a speedy trial, uh, typically for purposes of having more time to work with their counsel and, and be prepared for trial, because it's hard to get prepared for a, a complicated trial in six months. Uh, the ones that typically do not waive are the ones who are incarcerated. They want their trial, they want their day in court, if they have a chance to, to be relieved of, of incarceration and have their liberty back, they're going to take that. And, uh, you know, we try those within six months. Now, I can tell you that, and this goes back to a question I don't think I quite uh, finished answering what, that Rob asked, uh, in terms of our dockets, uh, the, everybody has a heavy docket. Magistrates are, are crushed, uh, for lack of a better word. They're, they're uh, running with their hair on fire because we just were two magistrates short, really. The uh, the circuit court judges are all very busy, and Judge uh, Kohi McLaughlin and I share the juvenile dockets in the uh, 23rd Circuit, so three counties. And I have abuse and neglect cases probably three days a week. Um, I have a dedicated Wednesday that is all abuse and neglect, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. And then typically, uh, Judge Kohi has Mondays, Judge Fair, uh, Judge. McLaughlin had Tuesdays, and then we're fighting over Thursdays and Fridays when we have overflow that needs to be taken care of. So it's uh, it, it's an incredible, fast-paced uh, docket for all three of us, and, and all six of the circuit court judges are very busy. What, hap yeah. what happens when the judge gets the flu and, and he's out for a week or two weeks? Does that just we, crush we, everything? It would. It would. Um, Fortunately, all of us seem to be fairly healthy, knock on wood. Uh, so that hasn't happened. Uh, you you ha kind of have to be careful about how much vacation you take uh, and keep an eye on your docket. And and uh, I try to jealously guard the couple of weeks that I set aside for vacation just so I can get away with my family and decompress a little bit. But, uh, no, it's, it's if you were to miss even a week uh, when – especially with the the juvenile docket you would it would take six months to catch up now with the juvenile docket uh one of the reasons you came in today was to discuss the comfort dog yes, what sir. you're trying to do would you discuss that please yeah I, i'm so excited about this yeah. project so i'm glad to have the opportunity to talk about it and and the support i've gotten publicly on this has been uh, heartwarming uh, i noticed well, I noticed back when I was practicing, uh, even 15 years ago, how incredibly stressful and anxiety-provoking it is for young people to come to court, uh, regardless of, of uh, 
whether they're there because they did something wrong in a delinquency case or maybe even a juvenile services case where the only thing that they're not doing is they're not going to school. Uh, they come in there and they're terrified of the judge, they're terrified of the prosecutor, and then it just, that stress exponentially increases as the, you start talking about children who are victims of, of child abuse or child yeah. neglect. And there's kids that come in and they don't trust anybody because of what they've been through. Um, so I, I was at a uh, national conference in Minnesota about four or four and a half years ago and had a discussion with a judge that was involved with a comfort dog. Um, and, and the other term that you'll hear thrown around is a facility dog. And uh, the anecdotal stories that were being told just were, were heartwarming uh, about how these kids just absolutely relaxed and when they relax, they're capable of telling their story, communicating their trauma in an effective way, and, and they get better justice. And we have children leaving the courtroom no more traumatized than when they came in, and, and that's my goal. I don't want, they've been through enough trauma. I don't want them, when they come into my courtroom, to be re-traumatized or further traumatized. Uh, so I started doing research on it and just you know, all you have to do is Google courthouse dog and you'll, you'll just get story after story after story of how incredible these animals are in putting these children at ease and uh, making them comfortable. And something as benign to us as, as a child coming into court and actually, and what we try to do with the abuse and neglect kids is have them testify in chambers. Mm -hmm. So it will be just the guardian ad litem representing the child the court reporter and myself uh, and even in that setting with no robe on and we try to make it as informal as possible uh, the the stress level for the kids is is uh, is palpable mm -hmm. and we'll be you know my my vision is to utilize the dog for in-camera interviews utilize the dog eventually when it's trained well enough to be unobtrusive and and the jury won't even notice it to be with the child when they testify during a trial uh, allow the dog to be loaned out to uh, the forensic interviewing team at Children's Home Society. They do all of our uh, Child Advocacy Center forensic interviews, which are very traumatic for those kids. And, and I've seen videos on YouTube of, of forensic interviewers using courthouse dogs or yeah. facility dogs and seeing how effective that's been. And maybe even as far as if somebody were to call from one of the two local hospitals that do uh, SANE examinations, which is sexual abuse nurse examiner examinations, which are incredibly uh, difficult for, for people to go through, that we would be willing to loan the dog to the nurses to assist in kind of de-stressing the people that are going through that process. So we, we're kind of working through the... Uh, but, but you have a dog that has been donated? Well, or in the process of being donated? Yeah, okay. and I, I'm not sure if it's going to be donated or not. Okay. Um, the initial plan, and we looked all over. The, the first thing was, was uh, narrowing down the breed. And the research I did uh, seemed to indicate to me that you were looking for a couple of things in, in a facility dog. One is it has to be intelligent. It has to be an intelligent breed. Two, it has to be a gentle breed. Uh, and three, the uh, issue of allergies came up. So th the most popular dog for this is a retriever, whether it be a Labrador or a Golden Retriever, mm -hmm. uh, because they're very smart, because they're very gentle and, and, uh, and they like people a lot. Mm -hmm. But that didn't take out the piece for the hypoallergenic. So uh, we started looking at breeds that were or dogs that were bred with poodles mm -hmm. because they're hypoallergenic. And looking all up and down the eastern seaboard and the mid-Atlantic region, it turns out that in our own backyard uh, in Berkeley Springs, there is a breeder who actually has been breeding golden doodles, so golden retrievers <laughs> and poodles, for years. Mm -hmm. And back in, I think, 1999, they recognized a need for, particularly for elderly people, and as it turns out, for children, mm -hmm. Uh, a need for a smaller version. They were the first breeder in the world to breed a mini golden doodle. Okay. Um, so we're looking at uh, it's uh, Fox Creek Farms. We're looking at obtaining a 
medium. We don't want too small because kids will trip over them. We don't want too big because yeah. the tails are like whips. Uh, my daughter had a <laughs> full-size golden doodle. And we're looking at getting a medium size, about 40 to 45 pounds, which would be perfect. Mm -hmm. uh, we've already looked at the the female and the sire and, and chose which one we want yeah. to get a uh, yeah. puppy from the litter. Uh, I think that female is in heat right now, so that mm -hmm. should be something that, uh, that pregnancy should happen soon. And we're looking at the dog being ready to leave the mother probably in early April and we'll go directly to 10 weeks of initial training. And the training will be done where? There's an organization that the breeder uses and I can't remember the name off of the top of my head but uh, they essentially have different breeders all around the mid-Atlantic area mm -hmm. and there's a uh, they have one breeder in Harpers Ferry which okay. would be good because we'd be able to go and visit and bond with the, sure. with the dog and uh, not be unfamiliar to the dog as it goes yeah. through the process so now with the uh, just a minute left here sure. but the the comfort dog the training for the court the courthouse would that be significantly different than the training for just going to a family yes yeah it, the 10 week piece yeah. has to be accomplished and that's really just good citizenship yeah. getting the dog to where it understands about 10 commands mm -hmm. The extended training will allow the dog to come into the courthouse, understand that it's to lay where it's laying, which would be inside the witness mm -hmm. box where the jury can't see it, um, so that any defense counsel is not concerned. They're just going to create undue sympathy for, for the victim yeah. uh, and be able to stay there, and, and the jury never have any idea that the animal was there, and, and that takes a while. So sure. we anticipate that between getting out of the puppy stage and getting to the point in training where it's capable of being used in the courtroom uh, during a trial it'd probably be at least a year okay steve uh, final word is yours well the only other thing i wanted to tell the voters is we have a big change coming up uh, we have the 23rd circuit which is jefferson berkeley and morgan being dissolved for this next election so the folks in jefferson will be voting for two judges There'll be their own standalone circuit, I believe, the 28th, and then Morgan and Berkeley will be together. We'll have four and a half judges, five judges for uh, the two counties, four and a half for Berkeley, half a judge for Morgan. We will be the 27th circuit, mm -hmm. so be aware of that when you go to the ballot box, and I uh, just appreciate everybody's support. It's been a great six and a half years, and I uh, look forward to continuing working with the folks in uh, mm -hmm. Morgan, and, I'm sorry, Morgan and Berkeley County. Steve, thanks for coming in. My pleasure. It's great seeing you guys.